Welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most important topics in the never dull world of Indiana basketball. This is our 126th edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 518th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, June 13th, 2019. I am your host, Jared Morris. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Martin takes the shot. The Hoosiers have won the national championship. So for this week's Banner Moment, we're going off the grid a bit. Uh, For one thing, not a ton happened this week, though if you want a traditional off-season Banner Moment, then consider Armand and Trace moving into their new Bloomington apartment after dominating the Kentucky All-Stars, or Romeo Langford getting invited to the NBA Draft Green Room. Both are small yet positive developments for the program. But the Banner Moment we're going with for this week is the moment our IU alumni magazines arrived in the mail because they're... Right above the table of contents was a picture of three guys with faces for podcasting who have been lucky enough to build an audience of IU fans by breaking down IU basketball games. And if you turn to the section in the magazine about podcasts by IU graduates, there is another picture of these same three goofy guys along with a nice little write-up about our show, which will be beginning its ninth season this November. Needless to say, we were very proud and excited to be featured in the Alumni Magazine. When you've invested a lot of time and effort and care into creating something, it feels really good to be recognized for your work. So on behalf of Andy and Ryan, I just want to thank Lance Farrell, the editor of the IU Alumni Magazine, for doing the feature on IU Podcasts, which everyone should read because there are some really incredible, meaningful podcasts being done by IU grads uh, and, and, of course, for considering us worthy of inclusion. We thank Lance for that. And we also want to thank Michael O'Connell for the piece that he wrote about our show and Ben Mraz for making us look good with his photographs. And most of all, we want to thank you, our listeners, our viewers, and even our hecklers for giving our show meaning. As I've said before, without your attention, your loyalty, and the community that you've created around our show, we're just three middle-aged dudes talking into our computers after IU basketball games and on Thursday nights. But because of you... We're fortunate enough to have an audience that pays attention to us and supports us, and we get cool opportunities like being in the alumni magazine, which just makes us feel good. So thank you. We started the show for ourselves, but really, truly, we're still here doing it because of you. All right. Now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. To my left, he is the Jawan Howard of Girls U Sports Coaching in Cincinnati, the president emeritus of the Robert Johnson Fan Club, and one of the world's most renowned bracketologists. And he also has some questionable Advice for Steve Kerr for how the Warriors can try to replace Kevin Durant's production during the rest of the NBA Finals. Well, Kevin Durant plays shooting guard. I should have Evan Fitzner play shooting guard. Hmm, I don't know about that. Uh, Andy, (laughs) what is your bottoms line on the last week in Indiana basketball? I'd love to know the context in which that was said, but it's neither neither here nor there. And also, it feels so much like funnier a, out of context. It also feels like a really poor time to to draw any attention to that social media post of Joey Brunk hitting multiple baseline jumpers in a row. Given we've all been burned by that before, so uh, perhaps perhaps I'll steer out of that territory again and and, uh, and and echo some of what you said about the alumni magazine. It was funny. Uh, I had I, I just had in my head that they would let us know when it was going to come out, and even when I got home from work that day, like I saw the alumni magazine sitting on the kitchen table thought nothing of it went on about our day and we're over at a neighborhood like end of school year party and my mom calls and they had just gotten home from visiting us and she's like hey guess who we just saw in the alumni magazine i was like oh no crap that was actually this <laughs> this edition so uh you know but uh definitely a cool opportunity appreciate uh, all the guys that you mentioned for making it uh, making it a reality i'm pretty sure that michael may have gotten far more than he wanted or needed when he interviewed the three of us at the same time uh and probably wanted to to got, gave him a good idea of what the podcast is about, but probably uh, also made him want to get off the call with us maybe earlier, maybe uh, maybe earlier than he ended up being able to do. But yes, uh, definitely a cool experience and a uh, good part of the week. I will say, you mentioned um, you know Trace and Armand moving in. I, f- I forget who it was that did a story on uh, these new like student athlete apartments or, or whatever we Hoosier call HQ. It. I think our buddies over at the uh, Hoosier okay. Sound. I think did that. It was uh, yeah. It, it looks uh, it looks pretty similar to uh, what I lived in in my freshman year in Briscoe. I would say um, I would say you could draw some parallels between those uh, those two in, in location only, I would say, but, uh, or proximity to assembly hall only, but, uh, but really cool. Another, you know, while not, not truly a, 
necessarily an athletics facility upgrade. We talk about the things with Cook Hall and, and the locker room and all those kinds of things. It is another thing that is important to prospective recruits. So uh, cool to see that. And it certainly makes anybody who went to college at IU anytime in the, in the uh, recent or even not so recent past a little bit jealous. And to my right, no, it is not Ryan Phillips. He has another week off, this time to cover Game 6 of the NBA Finals. I miss him. He's a great guy. We all do, Megan. Uh, it is also not the coach, Brian Tonsoni, who one week after missing the show to celebrate his son's wedding, clearly just got hammered. Beer, cheese curds, and music. It doesn't get any better. He has the week off to celebrate his anniversary with his lovely wife, Amy. I had to find the nicest looking lady. So in their place, it is one of our most frequent and popular guest co-hosts. Santa Claus. No, it is not Santa Claus, though in certain circles of the IU student body, he is known as the Santa Claus of the IU Sports Media School. Dominique Wilkins? No, it is not the human highlight film either, though his expansive YouTube channel is definitely an IU history highlight film. Uh... And it is also not... Oh, I forgot to put that drop in there. Well, that didn't, that's not work. I had a great drop of Ryan saying Tom Pritchard, but it's not there. Uh, but it is not Tom Pritchard, uh, though the animated gif of him so dancing... Much, <laughs> clearly so much time went into this. I'm so sorry that, that, didn't, that didn't come through there was, there, there was a lot of payoff for that. It just didn't for work a minute, out very I was well. like, should I just stay Tom Pritchard and pretend that it's a drop? I wasn't sure, but uh, continue. Dear Alumni Association, if you want to just remove us from the... From that issue, we will be okay with it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is another person whose show was featured in the podcast section, the godfather of IU Sports Podcasting, who's been doing it longer than anybody else. It is Galen Clavio, the host of Crimson Cast. Uh, Galen, what's on your mind right now when it comes to IU basketball? You know, just it feels like, weirdly enough, something about IU football made me think about IU basketball because oh we're start, we're start. I know weird and just maybe a bad omen. Want to think but, about IU football? Well, I'm just, what? no, no, no. It's the fact that you know we're we're getting some quotes from Tom Allen and and there's been some stuff going on with practice and and camps here over the summer and it's like wow, fall sports are back. And it it's like even though it's the middle of June, it does feel a little bit like we're getting closer to the start of the season. So that's. That's nice. Plus, I live in Bloomington, unlike you poor guys, and the our orientation started. Like, there's groups of kids walking around campus, and once that happens, it's like we're on that, that downward slope where we get to the start of the semester. So it's not that far away. It's, it's coming up relatively close. Uh, all we got to wait for is the schedule release, which will surely come any month now, right? You would hope so. You would hope so. Uh, by the way, here's that drop. Tom Pritchard. So there it was there. I just did. Nice. By the way, I, I didn't want to. Ma- I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> I met, I mentioned this to Jared, but I was in CVS on Kirkwood Avenue about a month and a half ago. And I'm, I'm up on the second floor. And this uh, this kid is walking near me and he looks up and he sees me and he's like, I know you from Assembly Call. <laughs> It was it was great. It was like it was just a classic classic situation. I loved it. And Galen grabbed him and said, "We've been doing our podcast longer than those guys." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys have had video longer than us, so it's probably fair. Uh, all right, so here's what we're going to talk about this week. Obviously, as you can tell, it's going to be a very loose show this week <laughs> without, without a whole lot of IU news. Uh, we're going to talk about a few Hoosier headlines. Uh, we are going to discuss. Uh, kind of predict uh, who we think are going to be some breakout players and talk about how we think the scoring uh, is going to come down next year with a lot of scoring leaving, who we think will be the scoring leaders. And then, as we always do, we will answer your questions. All of that coming this week on Assembly Call Radio. Before we get to all that, a real quick word from this week's sponsor, and that is SeatGeek. Do you ever feel like ticketing websites make getting to the event difficult on purpose? It's as if they're so big, they feel like they can get away with not caring about the customer experience. But not SeatGeek. SeatGeek cares desperately about the satisfaction of their customers, which is why a quick glance at the App Store shows over 50,000 five-star reviews. Why? Because SeatGeek delivers a better process for buying tickets. SeatGeek pulls together millions of tickets from all over the web, and then they rate each deal on a scale of 1 to 10. And the user interface communicates it all clearly by displaying tickets on an interactive seat map so you can see right where they are and by using a color-coded system for value. Green dots mean good deals, red dots are overpriced, and every purchase is fully guaranteed so you can shop for tickets with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone. It's by far the fastest and easiest way that I have found uh, to, to shop for and find tickets. When my wife and I want concert tickets, which we'll be getting uh, plenty during this basketball offseason, it's always the first place that we look. And best of all... Can a brother get some coupons? Of course you can. SeatGeek will give you $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. All you need to do is use our promo code. So download the SeatGeek app today and use the promo code ASSEMBLY 
for $10 off your first purchase. That's promo code ASSEMBLY for $10 off your first purchase. Okay, gentlemen. So let's talk about some Hoosier headlines. Uh, and I could just kind of throw out a few and uh, you can just react to whichever ones you want. Because as I said, not a whole lot happened. Galen, uh, we'll go with you first. But the headlines that I had this week, as I mentioned, Armand and Trace led the Indiana All-Stars to a dominant sweep over Kentucky. Romeo Langford will be in the green room. Uh, Juwan Morgan had some more interesting comments about Romeo Langford, speaking about how tough he was, how committed he was, you know, how how bad his back was before the Big Ten tournament, echoing some things that he had said on the Hoosier Hysterics podcast. Uh, and then also, Andy, you know, you mentioned the Joey Brunk video. Uh, I described it as him looking like a combination of Marshall Strickland and Kent Benson in the one minute video that they put together, which is typically what happens uh, with these uh, with these videos that we know uh, a certain member of our staff here at the assembly call is not a big fan of. I don't want to see workout tapes. Coach, not he doesn't want to see workout tapes. He wants he wants to see the real thing. Uh, So, Galen, that's kind of what happened. Do you want to react to any of those headlines? Anything jump out to you? I'm surprised Kentucky still plays high school basketball. (laughs) I, it, at this point, the the amount of trouble they've had with with Indiana high school basketball, I would think they would just fold up tent and go away. No, I thought that was it was great news. Obviously, any news where you know, I think everybody feels like Trace Jackson Davis is going to come in and compete. But the more you hear about uh, about Armand Franklin and what he is bringing to the table and how he just you know seems to continue to be getting better, I think it's something to reasonably get very excited about if you're an IU uh, fan and, and you're trying to figure out how this. Jenga puzzle of a lineup is supposed to fit together next year. So that's kind of the main thing for me. I, I look at that. And I mean, I want, like, I'm not shocked that Indiana ended up having a couple of great games against uh, the Kentucky All-Stars, but I, I am very encouraged by that news. And, you know, it seems like there's some momentum building there. And I think in the backcourt, it's, it's going to make it kind of an interesting situation as far as who gets to play and what lineups they decide to roll with. It's just a good thing John Calipari is not coaching the Kentucky All-Star teams because after a beatdown that dispiriting, he surely would just pull them out of the series and vow never to play it again. Certainly Drake, not in Drake will never come back to the Kentucky All-Star <laughs> game. Yeah, No, never. Andy, uh, what jumped out to you from any of those headlines? And did I miss uh, any? Did it, was, were there any that I missed? I, no, okay. I think that's it. I was surprised you came up with four, so good good work by you. <laughs> um, you know, the... I think the, the All-Star wins, I think it does show a level of two things chemistry and competitiveness with those guys that they uh you know really wanted to come out and and show well in, in that series really took care of business in both games i think even kentucky had talked about after the first game saying that's not going to happen again and i think they got beat worse the second game than they did the first um and, and i think you, you see a good chemistry between trace and armand which is is really important for a couple of guys that you think will be there for uh for at least a couple years and so uh you know those those are obviously exciting things and i think the you know, continued stuff about Romeo is uh, it, it's weird to, you know, kind of the heat that he's taken over the, the course of time uh, and how people have viewed or started to view his his one year at IU. But I think uh, for him personally, the the invite to the green room seems like a positive And at the very least, the fact that he accepted it seems like a positive um, based on what he's hearing. And, and the comments by Juwan continue to be ones that there's really no there's no benefit really for Juwan to say that to go out of his way to say those things um, at point based on where those two guys are. Neither one of them's here. Uh, neither one of them is worrying about alienating future IU teammates or whatever like that. I mean, I think it's truly um, you know, the actual story from a guy who was there to to know about it. So uh, I think those are positive. And like I said, I'm trying not to get. Uh, I'm not going to get too sucked into the to the video as we all thought Evan Fitzner would uh, never miss. And apparently, at some point. Uh, I felt it apt to compare him to Kevin Durant in some way, shape, or form. Ah, those audio drops that you just never live down. They're the best. Um, <laughs> you know, Galen, regarding the comments from Juwan, do you think that that does anything to affect the long-term legacy of Romeo? I mean, I'm, I'm glad he's speaking about that, just because some of the narratives that happened toward the end of the season were, you know, infuriating is probably the word that, you know, that comes to mind. Unfair is another word that comes to mind. And as Andy said, there's no real reason for him to come out and say these things if they're not true. So I'm glad that he is saying them because that was, you know, what he's saying is kind of the impression that I had of Romeo, but you lose 12 out of 13, things don't go well. You know, you never, you kind of never know and doubt will creep into your mind. And I'm just glad that he is kind of putting an end to it, and you'd really have to be searching for reasons to not like the kid if you're going to just ignore what, Ro- what Juwan is saying about him. Earlier today, I pondered and then decided not to put a poll up on the Crimson Cast account, which was 
which former IU player do IU fans owe the largest karmic debt to? Uh, and, mm. and Romeo Langford was was one of the individuals that was in the poll. Uh, Sean Klein and Bracey Wright also made the cut. So that'll kind of give you an idea of, of the lineup I was thinking of there. But look, I, I think a great question. <laughs> it is. I, I was like, who else would who else would go in that? Like Verdell Jones, Verdell Jones, Marco yes. Killingsworth, um, Pat Knight. I mean, there's a lot of p- different ways you could go with that fourth person in there. But um, you know, look, I, I I think I echo what you say to a large degree. I think that there's a lot of things that went on behind the scenes with Romeo Langford that people weren't privy to. His camp actually ended up being pretty quiet in terms of, of not publicizing those things. The, the kid pretty much got killed by everybody because he became much like, if we want to go last generation, much like Bracey Wright or, or Verdell Jones, kind of became the public whipping boy for people's frustrations about what was going on with the team. And it's unfortunate. I think it was doubly unfortunate with Romeo because there was so much hype coming in and people thought he was going to be able to provide a lot more but there was obviously a lot going on so i mean it doesn't change how i felt about it because i'd i'd heard a lot of those things behind the scenes myself it you know certainly it's hard to reconcile that in the in the moment of frustration of watching the team not do well and feeling internally like well somebody has to be to blame for this but in reality it's, I think, one of many unfortunate things that happened this year. I don't think it's going to make a big difference short term in the way that people's attitudes are toward him. But, uh, you know, we'll see long term. Hopefully, hopefully people start to realize what was going on and, and what he had to deal with throughout the course of the season. Devontae Green and Justin Smith could be guys that we end up owing a karmic debt to, depending on how. how <laughs> let's let's, let's, let's give it another year <laughs> yeah, just to just, see. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, let's move on here. Coming up on the assembly call, we are going to peer into our crystal balls and look ahead. Who do we feel most confident about as a breakout candidate for next season? And with no one on the roster who has ever averaged double figures in scoring, where are the points going to come from? We're going to discuss that. Stick with us. This is Verdell Jones. What's better than an epic buzzer beater? The full court dribble and a perfectly placed pass to set it all up. And of course, celebrating with Hoosier Nation afterwards. So join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the assembly call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosiers. Thank you, Verdell. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. You can find all of our content at our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to participate in our unedited live broadcast or watch those replays, then check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall. I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms and our special guest co-host, Galen Clavio from Crimson Cast. Guys, our friends over at Inside the Hall uh, had a couple of interesting articles on, on a week, as we mentioned, where not a lot happened. Uh, they kind of rolled out their off-season storylines um, series of articles. And so I thought a couple of them were would make for interesting fodder for discussion here. The first one was breakout candidates. Uh, this was by our buddy Seth Tao. Uh, and he, you know, for breakout candidates for next season, he listed Race Thompson, Joey Brunk, Demise Anderson, went into some of the reasons why he thinks that those guys are breakout candidates. So I want us to kind of go through and give our predictions for breakout candidates. Before we do that, though, I feel like we should get on the same page for what exactly is a breakout. Um, Because to me, like if a guy just jumps one level, just kind of progresses how you would normally expect them to progress, that's not really a breakout. Like if Justin Smith this season becomes kind of a, you know, a consistent contributor I suppose in one sense it's a breakout because he hasn't been that, but that's also the progression you would expect. If he becomes an all-Big Ten player, that to me is a breakout. So like a guy jumping two levels as opposed to just progressing one. As we talked about in the break, what Juwan Morgan did in Archie Miller's first season, that was a breakout, going from being a role player to an all-Big Ten level player. You know, An edge case that we discussed, Galen, was Al Durham. You know, Did he break out last year? You know, on the one hand, you know, he kind of progressed as you would expect, but you look at his numbers and he, you know, doubled some of those numbers and, you know, certainly had a stretch there where it really looked like he was breaking out. So, you know, we're probably not going to come up with a real firm definition, but, you know, do you guys have any thoughts on that before we, before we do this, just to make sure that we're framing it correctly? No. Okay. No, I think, well, yeah. I think what you said is fair. Okay. Well, then let's go into it, Andy. And why don't we, uh, why don't we start with you? Who do you think is most likely to be a guy that breaks out this season for Indiana. Uh, there's a couple guys that, that come to mind of the guys that, that Seth mentioned, 
maybe I'm uh, too caught up in what some of the uh, some of the guys have said about Demizi, but I think the other thing that stands out to me about him is, and and they had one one of the other ones was uh, their off season storylines was how the front court minutes kind of shake out, and to me that's almost why I didn't uh, I didn't pick Joey Brunk or Race Thompson because it is kind of a crowded front court and you know, even as guys emerge, there's still a bunch of other guys who might be able to take minutes versus Demise. plays, a, you know, if he can step in and play some minutes on the wing or at guard, there's not a ton of other guys necessarily competing for those minutes. That that obviously depends on the size, you know, what kind of lineup you want to put out there from a size standpoint. But um, if he's able to come out and shoot the ball, that's something this team desperately needs. Could make him a bit of a, a breakout guy. So I don't know that that means he turns into a guy who goes out and scores 10 points a game by any stretch of the imagination. But I think if he went from what he did last year to scoring seven or eight points a game, that would be, uh, that would constitute a breakout and something I think this team really needs to be able to, to have somebody who can really step up and score. So I'd lean him with the guys that were mentioned. The other one, um, I, I don't know how you would define breakout for a freshman, but uh, I'm really interested to see what Armand Franklin can do and if he can carve out some minutes for him. If, if the team wants to continue to play a little bit smaller, uh, as they did last year. I don't know if that's the, the case this year or not. Um, but I do think from a competitiveness standpoint, from a basketball IQ, all the things that you hear about him, feels like a guy who's going to come in, work really hard, and, and give himself a chance to be more of a contributor right away than maybe some people think. So uh, he would be another option. But I think the defining that for a freshman is even harder than it probably is for guys who have already been in the program. Yeah, I mean, for Demise, if you go from being a non-factor that's kind of unplayable to being a, a key rotation piece or a consistent player, that's a breakout. For a freshman, for Armand, I kind of think back to Al Durham's freshman year. You know, he kind of broke out as a freshman simply because very little was expected of him. And he got thrust into a role and really did better, I think, than most people expected that he would. That'll be interesting with Armand because I feel like he's so much has been talked about him. It's almost like he's gone from underrated to now we may be expecting too much, <laughs> you know, and I hope everybody will let him just ease in and be a freshman. Same with Trace, because um, I have high hopes for him as well, but I don't think he's going to come in right away and be, you know, junior year Robert Johnson. You know what I mean? And that it's almost like he's getting hyped up to that level. And we just need to make sure that we're being careful um, about that. Galen, I think IU fans will take a reasonable approach <laughs> to what we can expect from players, Jared. I don't think anyone needs you to tell them how to. <laughs> uh, what, what does right, Ryan say do. about it, do. <laughs> what does Ryan say about Indiana fans and our uh, reputation nationally? Indiana fans have a reputation nationally of being ridiculous. <laughs> uh, Galen, your thoughts on breakout players? <laughs> We're totally it's a completely sober group of fans when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> let's be honest. Uh, okay, I'm not going to count Joey Brunk. Because I don't think you can count a breakout player who's much like Andy was saying. It's like a freshman. Yes, we've kind of seen Joey. We don't know what Joey Brunk really is going to be like in a system where he feels more comfortable uh, than obviously what he felt at Butler. So I'm going to just delete him from the the exercise. I, I'm going to go with Race Thompson here because I think you look at a guy who's had two years in the system. Yes, he was out of competitive games last year because of the injury for most of the year, but he looked pretty good when he came back. And I think he's going he's gonna to seize minutes down low. I think he's going to be able to change the way that, uh, that, that Archie Miller hands his minutes out in the post. I like what he brings to the table. I don't know that he's necessarily going to have a breakout year from a scoring perspective, but I think from a rebounding perspective and from a defensive perspective, uh, he's a guy that's going to make a big difference. So, uh, you know, nothing against Demise Anderson or, or any of the other potential candidates, but he seems like the guy who is the most prepared and most ready to have a breakout season. Yeah, I, I think all of those thoughts make sense. The two guys that I'm going to go with, and this kind of transitions us into our next topic, talking about scoring, is Rob Finnessy and Devontae Green. Because, you know, I... Part of it to me is how many minutes are guys going to get? Just how much are they going to play? And when I look at the roster coming into next season, those are the two guys that I feel most confident saying they will lead the team in minutes. And I think Al Durham is probably up there too, but I don't know if he's you know quite at that level yet. I could see him being just a kind of a notch below those guys in terms of minutes. But you look at Rob, I mean, he averaged 6.8 points a game last year. He could very easily double that just with the natural progression of a sophomore getting more minutes. And, you know, more shooting consistency, which we saw from him before the concussion. Devontae Green averaged 9.4 points per game last year. And, you know, if you made me 
pick, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, who I think is going to lead the team in scoring next year, I think it'll be Devontae. Now, I don't think he'll double it. I don't think he'll get to 18 points per game. But, you know, typically the leading scorer, you know, is going to average 14, 15, 16 points per game, even on a team with, you know, balanced scoring and and not like a clear superstar. And so if he's improving his, you know, production by 50, 60 percent, you know, and just playing consistently, that would be, you know, something close to a breakout, even though you kind of expect that to happen as a senior. I think given the context of his entire career, I, I think I actually think I would feel more comfortable pinning it on those two guys, even over race and Demisey. Not that I disagree with your reasons for those guys, but just because I feel so much more confident in the minutes those two guys are going to get. Because I don't see any scenario where Devontae and Rob Finnessy are not playing 30 minutes a game. I just I just don't. And I think just by virtue of being on the court so much, the experience that Devontae has and the maturity that Rob already has as a sophomore, I have the most faith in those guys. I think with with Rob to a certain extent, I mean, Devontae is a little bit hard. You got a glimpse of potentially what his role will be in the NIT with Rob. It's a little bit difficult to say uh, again, it kind of goes back to how you define breakout. Everybody walked out of last season with a really positive opinion of him uh, and really minus the games where he missed with a, with his concussion and, and some of those kinds of things. It, it, it I'm not sure he takes as big of a, like he'll progress. I guess we kind of talked about that in the break. Like it will, he, you know, a prog- just, natural progression versus you know taking a leap to be kind of a breakout guy i think he'll definitely make that progression for the reasons that you said i don't know if he jumps his production so much that he becomes a breakout but maybe that's just semantics of how we would define that i'm with you on that andy i think oh well then it's not when galen and i are definitely right if he agrees with right well it's just that he he had you know he averaged 27 minutes a game last year and he averaged almost three assists a game last year and he averaged I mean, the, the 6.8 points per game, uh, that's, uh, that could certainly go up. I think it will go up, but I don't know if the shooting percentages are necessarily going to go up. It might just go up due to volume of shots taken, uh, unless he really has worked on his shot and gotten significantly better this offseason. That concussion so, really seemed to affect his shot, though, for a long time. So yeah, I think his efficiency will go up. I, and, I, and you may be right, and, and certainly I think it'll, hopefully as he gets more distance between him and the concussion, he'll be uh, more apt to drive to the basket and try to score down low, and that'll help the overall percentage. I just, I'm kind of in line with Andy in this, in that I think if you were going to look at a breakout year for Rob Finnessy, he already had it. You know, the, the freshman year NBA would come in and play as well as he did, uh, even with the team not necessarily performing as well around him. I, I don't know that he's going to be able to more than double that, which kind of feels like what the criteria of this category is. Hey, why don't we just have all these guys break out and yeah. things will be really good and then have Justin Smith be the true breakout like we all predicted last year and we'll be rolling. Things will be good. Uh, okay, so let's talk about scoring because as you start projecting forward, no Romeo, no Juwan, and we've talked at length about how we think you know losing those two guys is going to help Indiana improve its three-point percentage and you know be more efficient as a shooting team because of how inefficient those guys were shooting. Let's also remember how efficient those two guys were under the basket. I mean, really, really efficient. And they, I mean, they just assumed such a heavy load for the offense. So, you know, you look at, as I mentioned before, you know, no one on the roster has averaged double figures in a season yet. So you're really going to be relying on guys who haven't been leading men to be leading men from a scoring perspective. I have a trivia question for you, Galen. How many times since 1950 has Indiana's leading score averaged less than 15 points per game? How many seasons? I'm gonna Since say 1950. Six seasons? Pretty close. Seven. Oh. But six players. So because one guy one guy did I'll, it twice. I'll go ahead and claim that. Do, <laughs> do you, do you want to take a stab at naming any of the players who led the team in scoring with under 15 points? One of them is Andy's favorite player of all time. Um wait, Rob Johnson? <laughs> no. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> third third favorite player of all time after Rob Johnson and Calvert Cheney. I mean, Verdell Jones has to be one of them, right? Verdell's one of them, yes. Okay. He, and he was at 14.9, so he was almost there. That was in 2010. Okay. I don't know that I could name any of the other ones. Okay. In 2009, Devin Dumas, Andy's third oh favorite player, averaged 12.7 <laughs> points per game. I honestly that happened. Don't know that happened. That actually happened. I'm shocked anybody scored in 2009. <laughs> like, I, anyway, go on. <laughs> Even um, in that scenario, somebody has to lead, no matter how bad right. it was. 
doesn't really matter. I don't know what I've said over time that would make you even joke that that was my third favorite player. (laughs) Well, it's clearly not true. (laughs) Those Uh, were dark times. Dark times. Dark times. In 2007, DJ White averaged 13.8 points. In 1997, Andre Patterson uh, averaged 13.7 points, barely beat out AJ Guyton, who had 13.6. And then you have to go all the way back to 1968. Vern Payne averaged 14.8. And then 1950, 1951, Bill Garrett, 13.1 and 12.9. But that a totally different era, obviously. So it's almost unfair to count that one. Man. Point being, it doesn't happen very often. But I think as you look at this season, I could very easily see this being one of those seasons where, you know, Devontae averages 13 and a half. Rob averages 12. Al Durham averages 11. And then you get a whole bunch of guys, you know, Duran averages eight, Brunk averages nine, like just on down the list. So, you know, and look, you can still win that way. It's not ideal. Obviously, you know, none of the teams that I just mentioned were particularly great teams. Um, But my questions to you guys, do you think anyone averages more than 15 points this season, Andy? And who do you think will average in double figures this season? I don't. If anybody averages 15 points, I would say Devante, but I would tend to lean know that no one will score 15 points score 15 points a game this year galen what do you think i feel the same way i i when i sketched this out in advance of the podcast i had Devonte averaging 14 points a game hey. and i had three other players in double figures i had rob at 12 justin smith at 11 and al durham at 10 uh so uh, and i think i've got two guys right on the edge of that i think Jerron davis and joey bronco both average nine points a game so and they're kind of like one guy, you know. I mean, <laughs> right? But if they're but if if that's the case, then they would the like Voltron Brunk Davis would yeah. score eighteen <laughs> points a right. game, which would be that'd be fine, you know. It is interesting. I did some math on this. So IU scored two thousand two hundred and eighty nine points last year, and they lost twelve hundred and forty seven of those points. So they've only got a thousand forty two points coming back. Uh, but the top six scorers only averaged 64.7 points per game. So, you know, you look at the the scoring numbers that I, and I threw these up before I did that calculation, that w- the numbers I added up would be 65 points a game. So there might not be that much of a drop-off. It might just be a situation where it's a little more evenly spread. And on a team that doesn't have like a bona fide top-level scorer, this might not be the worst thing in the world if they can combine it with really good defense. And the thing that strikes me about all of the teams that you mentioned, at least the modern ones, uh, the, the 09 team, the 97 team, both of those really struggled defensively. That 07 team was weird. They couldn't score, but no one could score on them. And, you know, in, in the if you look back historically, that actually ended up being a pretty good year in retrospect, although not everybody realized it at the time. Was that Samson's first year? It was. That was yeah. the, and they ended up as about a seven seed in the tournament. They almost knocked off UCLA in the second round. They were, that was the team that went into Durham and I think lost. It was like 53 51 or something like that. Like it was a really slow scoring game against Duke that they, they almost pulled out. So um, yeah, it was, that was Samson's first year. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and the wild card in all of this, of course, is Jerome Hunter. I mean, we, you know, kind of have to throw that out there because he's a guy that I could, and again, you want to be, <laughs> he's been hyped up so much. This is another guy that we've got to slow down. He's been out of bas- He'll, he'll have been out of basketball for a year. If he's able to play, he's still going to be a freshman kind of going through it for the first time. So, you know, it's easy to just say, oh, yeah, he'll step in and provide all that wing scoring production. You know, he's a guy, if you can get, you know, seven, eight, nine points per game out of him, you would feel pretty good about that, too. And hopefully maybe by the end of the season could be a double figure score. But I I really, you know, I, I think the way that you look at this, you know, for this thing to be successful and just the way that it seems most likely is especially early on, Devontae, Rob, and Al are really going to have to assume a big part of that scoring punch. And you hope that Justin Smith can do that too. But especially with the longer three-point line and you know his struggles to shoot, it's really going to have to come in transition, offensive rebounding, doing some of those things. Hopefully he's really focused on those things. And then, you know, if you can count on, as you said, the Voltron, Brunk, and Deron Davis, you know, to get you 15, 16, you know, 17 points. That's really where it's got to come from. And then hopefully as the season goes on, you can get, you know, Trace Jackson Davis to be a consistent score, Armand to be a consistent score. Maybe a guy like Demizi steps up as a guy who can come in and knock down a couple threes a game for you. You know, Jerome Hunter, another guy. So, but I think the the you know, the bulk of it is gonna have to go to those experienced guards and the big men early on. And then you kind of bring those other guys along and hopefully the offense comes around. But I, you know, I do think Indiana's gonna have to win games early on with defense, Galen. Uh, you know, and 
you know, the, the one thing that we've seen with pack line teams is in the third season, the defense usually comes around pretty well and you've got more institutional knowledge, you know, more guys hopefully recruited to the system. So the offense is a worry and it's going to be a lot different this year. But I think early on, Indiana is really going to have to rely on its defense. And then hopefully the offense comes around as the season goes. There has to be better shooting, like oh, just across the board. There just has to be better shooting. And there has to be better game planning and better offensive tactics by the coaching staff to try to get these guys shots. Because as we saw for most of last year, I mean, they, they were over-reliant on Romeo Langford inventing drives and figuring out how to get inside. They were over-inventive on dumping the ball into Juwan Morgan and triple teams and having him figure stuff out in the block on his own. It, it was... It's not a sustainable trajectory, and I think it's what makes this year so hard, for, you know, for anybody to figure out. I think in terms of what's going to happen, because you just don't know how, like, what are defenses going to key on? Who, who do you come out and say, "Well, we're going to stop that guy"? I mean, you could try to stop Devontae Green; he'll just take thirty-foot jump shots. He 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 might miss them all, but he'll take them. You can't really effectively defend that guy in a traditional manner. And and so I think that everybody's confused as far as what the offense is going to be here, uh, and and you know it's it's going to be really fascinating to watch it develop, and I think it's going to be a work in progress probably into the early part of the Big Ten season. Andy, do we think one thing that we haven't talked about a lot is free throw shooting, which has been abysmal for two straight years? Do we think that improves? You know, Romeo shot seventy two percent and was much better toward the end of the season. Juwan, you know, struggled again, shooting sixty five percent. So together, those guys were under seventy percent. Uh, you know, Fitzner didn't add many. He only took 15 free throws. But, you know, you'd think with, you know, if guys like uh, uh, Devontae and Al are taking more free throws because they're around 75%, maybe a tick below that, um, you know, you'd think that maybe the free throw shooting would improve. Justin Smith, only 51%. That's another place where Indiana can maybe steal a few more points. Um, you know, do how do you see that kind of projecting out this year? Yeah, I mean, I think you got to project as you said, the guys most likely to take those are, are the guards at this point, given that they'll probably have the ball in their hands the most. Um, but I think you've still got guys like Justin and Duran who, to the extent that they get to the line, you don't really know uh, what you can expect there. Joey Brunk was a 65% free, free throw shooter last year. So about uh, again, as a big guy, you know, is he able to, to do a little bit better than that? So, I, I would tend to think it gets a little bit better if for no other reason than it's hard to envision it being worse. Um, but I do think the, the guys who are most likely to get fouled on this particular team um, seem to be among the better free throw shooters on the team for the, for the most part, certainly guys on the perimeter. Um, Galen, I was curious where you had uh, Trace from a scoring perspective as you sketched that out. Uh, he is part of the, the Davis Brunk Voltron, uh, which is which would be a uh, nine points per game each. Or, uh, sorry, and um, then the Trace Jackson Davis third part of the Voltron is also at nine points a game. So I actually, actually wow. I think all of those points are interchangeable, and I do think that Trace Jackson Davis is going to come in and make an impact. I mean, if people forget Deron Davis as a freshman, I think averaged nine nine and a half points a game. Uh, I think it's entirely possible that Trace Jackson Davis is able to do exactly the same thing. Deron yeah, Davis also shot just, 76% from the free throw line his freshman year and has been around the 50s. So, And he's got like a nice a, free throw stroke, so it would really be nice if he would get that, back to that. that. That feels like it happened before the polar shift. You know, like it, feel, it, it <laughs> feels like from the from the Jurassic period or something. Yeah, Andy, what were you going to say? Yeah, I think what I, I feel like what we'll probably find is that given all those front court guys, we'll ideally after a handful of games kind of get into a doesn't matter who scores it but you need x amount of points from the front court and it's going to be different guys contributing each night but i think eventually you'll get to a point where you've got a pretty good target for that i know guard rebounds was one of those things a couple years ago where he was like hey we need to get to you know x number of that i think you might find the same thing in the front court and figure that out i think trace could find his way into double figures just by activity level putbacks different things like that where he could score close to double figures and maybe not make a shot outside of you know five feet from the basket uh, potentially just based on activity level and things like that. But you got to figure out how the minutes shake out in the front court among all those guys who can, you know, stake, have a chance to stake their claim to, to playing time in a potential starting role. I'll tell you another place where Indiana could be improved next year that's not getting a lot of play is in transition, actually. Because with Trace and Justin Smith, 
you could have a really lethal transition combo. And last year, Indiana was not good in transition. Romeo was really bad in transition. Our guards weren't very good. And basically, Justin was the only one who finished with any efficiency. That should be one of Trace's, you know, one of the things he can really do, uh, you know. And, and, and Joey Brunk, too, you know, seems like he'll be, you know, pretty good at that as a big man. So I think that's another place. You know, as you just look for, you know, on the margins, where can Indiana maybe get a couple more points, be a little bit more efficient? You know, you improve the free throw shooting a little bit, get a little bit more out of your transition opportunities, and I think those can go a long way uh, toward helping out the offense. All right, coming up in our third segment, we are going to answer your questions, which include one about the in-game experience at Simon Scott Assembly Hall and another about Archie Miller's decision to roll with just 11 scholarship players, at least for now. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. Ethan Happ, and I never listen to the assembly call, especially the episodes that Ryan is on. Thank you, Ethan. Hopefully you're listening to this episode then. Welcome back to the assembly call. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms and Galen Clavio from Crimson Cast. Remember that you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter. We send out a weekly IU News Roundup even during the offseason, and after every game, we send out a detailed post-game analysis. Just text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. That's IU to 66866. Or go to assemblycall.com. All right, guys, it's time for our mailbag. These questions were submitted uh, in our private IU basketball discussion community, which you can learn more about at assemblycall.com slash community. Uh, Andy, we got a, a question. Uh, well, a, a comment and then a question from CW76. He says, you all need to do a classic Hoosiers post game this summer. Galen will be great to get involved as he has quite a few games archived. We have talked about that. We do need to do that at some point. So let's use this as like, let's actually do that sometime this off season. We'll pick a game. I'm thinking maybe early nineties, you know, something of that vintage, uh, have a little, have a little fun there. Um, we do need to do that though. Uh, maybe, you know, what would be a good one? Maybe one of the fab five games with Juwan Howard in it. Cause there were some classic battles. So maybe we'll do it one worked. of those. Cause that'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, but C-Dub's question, he says, my question would be thoughts on Coach Miller's plan to hold on uh, with just 11 scholarships. We've covered this before. I didn't know, Andy, if there was anything interesting in light of you know the notice of infractions that are apparently coming down against six schools, you know, because that's one of the things Archie talked about is sometimes guys can fall in your lap, you know, potential transfers, maybe not for this year, but, you know, sit out transfers, um, you know, any any lingering thoughts on the 11 scholarship storyline? Yeah, I think it remains to be seen what what options would really come out of that. We talked about a little bit during the break, you know, maybe a freshman who's enrolled there. It just all, is all dependent upon the timing. If you get to the point of the year when, you know, school started and those kinds of things, then your flexibility for anything this year is extremely limited, if not gone. Um, for potential guys that would sit out, then then you do open yourself up to some some potential options there. I think at that point it. it you know, to me, it's just a matter of does the flexibility that the, those two scholarships provide you, is that worth more than what you might get out of bringing somebody in at the 11th hour um, that, that may not really fit what you want to do? And I think the answer to that question is yes. At this point, uh, it, it's certainly a risk because of uh, Jerome Hunter's injury, as we've talked about before, and knowing what you might be able to get from him and just having that few bodies from a practice perspective, um, you know, even last year with a ton of guys on scholarship and even, you know, a walk on like McRoberts, you had a number of guys and you still struggled at various points to be able to, to get enough guys to really get a competitive practice going. So that to me is the potential downside. Um, but again, we've seen in the past, you know, handing out scholarships, filling them for the sake of filling them, which really never panned out in any way, shape or form. So, uh, I think at this point, you stay committed to guys that you think can really help you right now. And if you don't have those guys out there and you don't have ones you can bring in as transfers, you hold on to the scholarships until uh, you have options for for somebody else that could come around and could help you. Well said. Uh, Galen, I want to get to this question from Brian, our longtime listener, Brian. He said he would like to hear a discussion debate on the current game day experience at Simon Scott Assembly Hall. It was a long email that he sent us, but... You know, he was wondering about possible changes to the student section, you know, especially if students aren't filling up all their allotted tickets, possibly renovating the balconies, changing up the in-game experience. Uh, you know, if there's anything that, that should be done with student behavior, especially in light of last year's, you know, issue with the chanting, which definitely got overblown. 
Um, but just your, yeah, obviously you're there, you go to more games than we do. So that's why we wanted to, we held this question for you, your thoughts on the game day experience and, you know, and coach has said on the show, you know, blasphemous as it may be that the in-game experience at Mackey arena is better than the in-game experience at, at assembly hall. I haven't been to Mackey in good Lord, 20 years. So I don't know what they're doing now, but your, your general thoughts on that and things that Indiana could potentially do to make that better. Well, I th- look, I think if, if the in-game experience at Mackey is better over the last few years, it's because they've had a better team and a better Ugh. program, and then they've won more. And I think really that's what it comes down to. I think people are expecting to walk into Assembly Hall and have the same experience that they had when they were, you know, when, when it was the 1980s or the 1990s or even the, the early to mid-2000s when the place, you know, had this atmosphere and its life all its own. And that's, it's just not there right now. And it hasn't been for a while. And I think that that it did. I don't think it comes down to the marketing. I don't think it comes down to like the student section being somehow worse than it was before. Um, I, I think those are effects and not causes. And I think the cause is ultimately just the fact that for the last 25 plus years, this, this program is underachieved relative to what its prior level of achievement was. And, you know, you, you can walk into some, some really excellent environments in college basketball around the country. And they're almost always attached to programs that have won consistently and people go and they're naturally excited because they know they're there to watch a winner. I mean, I went down to Cameron to watch, uh, you know, the IU Duke game this year. And, you know, granted Cameron is a very special place all by itself, but it's that way because they've won for so long. And there's an, the, the atmosphere down there was the closest thing I've come to reminding me of what the atmosphere was like in the late nineties in, in assembly hall when I first stepped in there as a student. So I just, you know, to me, I think almost all of it, all of the problems that people complain about have just stemmed from a lack of success relative to what we think IU basketball should be. And I think that's what needs to change. And I think if that changes, a lot of other stuff will fall into place. Uh, I think, uh, I think assembly hall marketing, like the athletic department, they're doing the best they can with what they've got right now. And there's only so much you can squeeze, uh, you know, out of a situation where people, are walking in there and, and they're not as jazzed up as they used to be. It's funny because Galen and I, before the show, we're talking about uh, U.S. men's soccer team and versus the, the women's team. And so I went to the national team game uh, here on Sunday and they played poorly. But even before the play was poor, the atmosphere was a 180 from having gone to see the U.S. women's team two or three years prior. Um the amount of people there was less. I mean, the women's game was like a party atmosphere because the excitement of winning and what you were going to see and the anticipation of the excellence that you were going to see was completely different than what you'd expect. And the result on the field actually played out that kind of reinforced the kind of, eh, I'm going to take a wait and see type of attitude. But to me, the, you could do whatever you want between timeouts. If the team is exciting and winning, that that excitement gets you through from the end of play to the when play resumes again. That excitement overarches everything, and that, that goes, like you said, about Duke to any place else. Um, watching a winner is a hell of a lot more fun than watching a team that's been mediocre and inconsistent. And there's not a lot of things you can do to, you know, put air back in the balloon when when some of that's been removed based on just the general lack of excitement. So. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing, but there's there's definitely some truth to that. Uh, finally here, Galen, Joe says that he would like to personally thank you for your extensive YouTube collection. Uh, many hours of pleasure for him and all the IU fans. It's the greatest <laughs> gold mine on the internet. Chronic Hoosier would also like to thank you for that as well. Uh, so just uh, we just want to plug the uh, the YouTube channel, yeah. Dr. Dr. GC. You've got all those games on there. You keep adding them. Oh, he wants to know. Uh, if you've ever tried to track down more games from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, or more of those old Channel 4 games. we got about uh, 20 well, seconds. Channel, Channel 4 games are tough to come by for a lot of reasons, but keep an eye on the YouTube channel this summer because there's some pretty cool stuff from the 60s and 70s and 80s coming down the pike. I've had some folks send some stuff into me, so uh, you'll you guys will enjoy what you see, I promise. That's, awesome. That's it. We're done. No more questions. All righty, that's going to do it for us on this week's edition of the Assembly Call. If you want to see us do the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. And, of course, you can always subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. 
And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk with you again next Thursday night. More IU basketball talk. Until then. Take it from me, Freddie Max Wayne Jr. Keep your elbows in, your eyes on the rim. And man, go up and dunk the ball. Go Hoosers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you.